Posey. Come on, in the yeah. Um, praise the Lord. That 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 will work. Come on down. Amen. See now, this feels more community now. Amen. This is more family. Praise the Lord. Amen. I hope I'm not on yet, but I see the green light. Amen. Anyway, thank you for coming out this morning. Amen. Give yourselves a hand. Because I, I, know, I, I know how this works. Because even though I'm the pastor, I'm still human. And so at one point I thought maybe we should just cancel this thing. You know, but... But of course not, of course. I'm just saying that to you because I, I know how some of you felt this morning. Some of you, you know, like, uh, it's all good. We all feel the same way. We're here, and that's a blessing. Amen? And uh, I, I'm excited for what God is doing in this new year. Now, the only thing that I did not like about the new year was the snow. No, seriously. What a way to start the new year, man. And uh, our trip to Nicaragua got canceled, and that was a bummer. And, and we had our suitcases right by the door when I got the ding from American Airlines. The flight has been canceled. But we're going, we rescheduled, and we're going uh, the first part of February. Amen. And we're still going to do what we do. Our pastor from... Uh, Fort Lauderdale went. He was planning on going with us. So I told him, go ahead and represent CrossNet. And he did an awesome job. Amazing. And uh, they had uh, about 300 and some odd pastors there. And um, he did, just did an awesome job. He's a true son. He represented us well. Amen? Okay, but well, you know, we started this new series, The Heart of God. Amen? If you were not here last Sunday... Make sure you go to YouTube and check it out. It'll bless you. The heart of God. So a lot of times, you know what we do. So now I should be on. So a lot of times we operate. In fact, every, everything that we do, most decisions and so on, we operate from our heart. And you ever hear people say, do what's in your heart. Am I the only one that's heard that? Okay. <laughs> They'll say, do what's in your heart. The problem with that is you don't know what's in their heart. But God, he makes his heart plain and visible. If you want to know God's heart, all you got to do is read the scripture, especially the, the gospels, because that's where he shows where his heart is. Now think about it. The Bible says, wherever your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Hello. Meaning that whatever you value, that's where your heart is. Like some people say, you know, well, you know, my heart is to do this, but their value system is the opposite. And sometimes we don't get it, you know, because, because the, the Bible is clear. It is saying that wherever your treasure or your value is, there will your heart be also. Come on. And that's how we can tell God's heart. Because he, what he values is what's on his heart. So last Sunday we were talking about, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Right? So his heart was to redeem us. His plan from day one, from the, from the day that Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, he had a plan already. And his plan was to redeem us. But the way that he was to redeem us is different than what we redeem. We redeem stuff like money. Or you ever got a coupon and it says you take it to wherever and redeem it, right? You get something. But the only way that God can redeem us was the shedding of blood. And so he sent his son to shed his blood to redeem us, or the word means to buy back. Are y'all here? And so we was, 
It, why is it important to get connected with, with God's heart? Because we've been made in his image and in his likeness. We are Christians, which simply means followers of Christ. Come on. So therefore, we should know what we're following and why we're following. So, so the Bible says in the Old Testament that he would take a heart of flesh, come on, or a heart of stone and replace it, come on. So whether you, whether you know it or not, you have God's heart. Amen. But we have to understand that and we, we have to make up our minds. Yes, I want to flow in his heart. And why not? Why would anybody not want to do that? Very simple. It's because they're not ready to give up their own heart. See, God doesn't want us, uh, when we come to him, right? You've heard this, the people say, if you accept Christ into your heart, they don't say accept Christ into your stomach or, you know, your heart. Why? Because it's pretty simple. That's where everything comes out of. Amen? So I want to pick this up. The title of today's message is The Heart of God and the Prodigal. The Heart of God and the Prodigal. So uh, let me say this right off the bat. You have people that are, don't know God. And God goes after them. But then you have people that know God but strayed away from him. And those have to come back. I'm going to say this again. God runs after those that don't know him. But the ones that know him and have gone astray, he doesn't run after. They have to come back. I'm going to prove it to you. We'll start actually in Luke chapter 15, verse 8. It says, Or oh, what woman... Having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. Next verse says, And when she found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Holy Spirit. We thank you for helping us to understand your heart because you are everything to us and you mean everything to us you're the one that saved us you're the one that keeps us you're the one that heals us and we're so grateful for that and we thank you for this word in Jesus name so what's interesting is that um, Jesus uses an illustration of a woman that has 10 silver coins but she loses one and instead of her saying, well, at least I still have nine, she said, no, because this is a value. So she lights up a lamp and she starts searching for the one. And when she found it, she rejoiced and then calls everybody else and says, hey, rejoice with me. I found it. Come on. And then uh, the Bible says, likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels. See, now, this is God's heart. He's expressing his heart. He's saying, this is what makes me uh, uh, happy. This is what makes me excited. I don't know what makes you excited. Maybe, maybe if, if you pray to me and ask me for a car and you get blessed with a car, that's what excites you. 
Maybe it's because you're, you're tight and, and you're believing me for money and that money comes, that excites you. But let me tell you what excites my heart. If it means anything to us. Amen. He says, likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner. One. One sinner who repents. And so here's the thing. If there is, if there is joy in the presence of the angels, because some people interpret that, they go, oh, the angels were rejoicing, but it doesn't say that. Hello. It doesn't say the angels were rejoicing. It says there was joy in their presence. So who else is up there? So what this is really saying is that God got so excited that it was the Father that was rejoicing and just saying, yes, in the presence of the angels. Here we go, I ain't hearing me. Zephaniah, I know many of us are wondering, is that in the Bible? <laughs> Zephaniah 3, it says, The Lord your God in the midst, the mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Can you get the picture of God singing and rejoicing every time? Someone comes to the Lord. That reveals his heart. Come on. What makes us happy? What causes us to rejoice is different than what causes God to rejoice. God, God don't need no, no material things. There's not much, my friend, that, that would make God happy. Except... When someone comes to him. And then this is the thing. I said it last Sunday. Uh, we understand now God's purpose and his heart on the earth. But guess what? The, the work on the cross, he said, it is finished. His part was finished, but our part just started. And we are to carry out his heart on the earth. And the reason, and I said this before, the reason that we see the church uh, 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 that appears to be amazing and, you know, look at that church. It has 15,000 people and look at this and look at that. And they talk about the services and they had a service. It was so amazing and so on and so forth. The reason that that happens, my friend, is because we are not considering his heart. We're considering our own hearts. What makes us happy? What, what, what we think is right. What, what we think God wants. And that's why you have those church growth, growth seminars. They charge a hundred bucks each. First of all, how are you going to charge? You ain't trying to hear me. How are you going to charge to tell me what's in the Bible? <laughs> you know. And I'm going to give you a hundred bucks so you can tell me how to grow the church, but I don't even tithe. There's three amens on that one. Now. Come on. And it's like, that does not make sense, but listen very carefully. The reason that happens is because the church is still trying to find the heart of God. And if you don't find the heart of God, it's very simple. The deduction of that is selfishness will rule your heart. Because it was selfishness that caused Eve to eat of that tree. It was selfishness that caused Adam to eat after she ate. Because she, the, the, uh, Satan told her, if you eat of this, you'll be like God. Now you got everything. Everything. But you still didn't, didn't know his heart. And so 
you ate of the tree because of your selfish motive. And then she gave to Adam and he ate because of his selfish motives, motive, which was, if I don't eat, I'm going to lose you. You're not here. And so I'm going to eat even though, it, even though I know it's wrong, but at least I will still keep you. Say selfishness. And since then, the heart of man is just full of selfishness. It's more about me, and it's more about what I want, and it's more about, uh, you know, uh, uh, what's, what's, what I value and what's important to me. Most people, my friend, make decisions based on their selfish motive. It's the truth. It's not going to God and saying, God, but what do you want? Come on. It's the truth. But it says that, that God will rejoice. He will be singing. Have you ever had a picture in your mind of God singing over you? Have, have you ever had a picture in your mind of God rejoicing and, and just laughing? No, most people, you know how they see God? He's waiting for me to make a mistake. Because I grew up that way. I grew up Catholic. And, and the Catholic and my mom used to always tell me, man, and she used to tell me in Spanish, you know, Papa Dios te va a castigar. I still hear it, and when I say it, I shake. I was little, man. You know, granted, I was a bad kid. I was, man. You know, I almost burned a house down one time. because This is how stupid I was. I was very, very young. And I, was, I wanted to uh, see something under the bed. And so I lit a match and went, <laughs> that thing went crazy. So, you know, everything was God is going to punish you. And, and, and that's the picture that most people have. But God is not like that. In fact, God loves us so much that he rejoices over us when we come to him. He rejoices when we, when we come to him and when we say, Lord, I love you. And I put this on Facebook. It's super important. It had just come to my mind. I said, if you're going to minister to others without ministering to God first, you know, then it's in vain. And, and interestingly enough, the most people that responded to it were pastors because they knew. Because people want to do things without ministering to the Lord. In fact, most Christians don't know what ministering to the Lord is. But the book of Acts, it talks about how they ministered unto the Lord. And the only way you can minister unto the Lord is to acknowledge who he is. And to acknowledge his goodness and to acknowledge that he is Lord and there is no other. So when you minister to him, the Holy Spirit ministers to you. And then you're ready to minister to others. My friend, because we cannot give what we don't have. Amen. Proverbs 11, 30. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. Now, why is it that the most messages that get response from people are the messages of the promises of God toward us? Come on. Like if somebody gets up and they start telling you about the promises of God, over 8,000 promises, and they are yours, people are rejoicing. <laughs> Hallelujah. Preach now. Come on. <laughs> no, really. But when it talks about what you can give to God, it's different. Because God's heart, he doesn't want our money. God doesn't need our money. God does not have no financial problems. But here we are on the earth. Yes, the church, we need to keep these lights on and, and the heat. Thank God that we didn't tell you to come to church, but there's no heat. <laughs> Shoot, even I wouldn't come. Seriously, right? 
But, but yeah, we need money to keep things going and for missions and all that. But God himself does not need money. Everything comes from God. He needs one thing, my friend. God needs one thing. And that is souls. It's why he died. It's why he suffered. Hello? And, and like I said last week, man, all we have to do is plant seeds. Plant seeds. It, the, the, the whole idea of seeds is universal. Everything you do has to do with planting seeds. If you want somebody to like you, plant the seed of like. Does that make sense? Just didn't sound right, but I think you know what I'm saying. If you don't plant the seed of being nice to somebody, how do you expect them to be nice to you? Right? If you want a job and you go for that interview, plant the seed of who you are and how you can contribute to that business. See, I'm, I'm trying to help you to understand it's not just uh, uh, planting seeds. You know, oh, planting seeds is unique to, to evangelism. No, it's not. It's how the world functions. Come on. And so plant a seed to your family, to your friends, to your neighbors. In our place, most people already know. We haven't been living there, I think, almost a year now. Everybody knows we're Christians. Everybody knows we're pastors. Some of them have come to church. Hello. Why? Because you're planting seeds. They didn't do it right away. Guess what? They found out, and then we hung out. And we, we cooked some burgers on our thing, and they came, and they hang out, and they, they were thinking, they're pastors? Why? Because people have a perception of Christians. The wrong perception. And when they realize we're just like you, they showed up. Hello? And you know what I'm thinking? That makes God happy. Come on. Do you want to make God happy? That's the thing. Do you want to know his heart? So now what's interesting about this, the word wise, most people think, well, if I win souls, I'll be smarter. <laughs> it doesn't mean that. The word wise there is the Hebrew word jada, which means to praise. Do you realize that winning souls is a praise unto the Lord? So you're like, I don't know how to praise God. Win souls. That's what it's saying. He who wins souls is wise. He who wins souls is a praise unto the Lord. And why is this message important? Because we're moving so Far away from God's heart. Back in the 70s, my friend, there was, you've heard me say this, there was a huge revival. And that huge revival had to do with people realizing who God was and what he wanted. And that's, that's how we got saved. It was a, a guy named Dave Wilkerson, you probably heard of him, who lived in Pennsylvania. And God told him, go to New York City. And he was a farmer. I mean, in Pennsylvania, he came to New York City and God anointed him and all the gang members. Everybody was getting saved. The drug addicts were getting saved. That was my time. And I, would, I told you last week, I was ripe, but nobody knew it because all they saw was the external. All they saw was this dude that would rob you in a minute. He would burglarize your apartment. He would take your money. That's all they saw. I was addicted. But when God sent someone to me, it's because I was ripe. And he was the only one that had the guts and the heart of God to come to me and to tell me about the Lord. Boom, and it happened. So you can look at people that, 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 that look like they, they ain't trying to hear you, right? They're they like, mm, you don't even want to mess with them. You, know, you go like, man, get out of here with that attitude. And God is saying, you don't realize that person is ripe. The harvest is plentiful, 
but the laborers are few. And let me tell you something about that. Because a lot of Christians, they go like, well, they're going to do it. So somebody's going to do it. I don't have to. That's why the laborers are few. Because people think there are those that God will call to do it. No, my friend, he's, he's calling everybody. And, when, and, and in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, is it 517 or 518, he says he has given us a ministry. Yeah, God is going to call the evangelist to do it. Let the evangelist do it. My friend, let me tell you something about the fivefold. The fivefold is not supposed to do anything. The Bible doesn't say that they're going to do it. The Bible says they will equip people to do it. Hello? So if I had an evangelist come up here, he's not going to say, well, this is, this is what I do. No, he's going to say, let me teach you how it's done. Let me equip you because we're the ones that have to do it. They will equip us to do the work of the ministry. That's what the Bible says. Can I get an amen? amen. Even if you don't want to. <laughs> Let's go back to Luke 15, 11. Then he said, a certain man had two sons. I love to hear Paul teach, and, but when Jesus is teaching, you got to pay attention, man. So he says, then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. So this is what's interesting, is that this parable is not for the loss. Hello. Most people teach this parable, yeah, man, yeah, they're out there. The sinners are out there. Well, let me tell you something. How can there be sinners out there if they don't know they're sinning. Really. You know, you know the, the sinners, they don't know they're sinning. They don't consider themselves sinners. Come on. Only until we come to them and share with them the truth, then they go like, oh, okay. But this right here is written to someone who knew the Father was with him and then decided to get his inheritance or his portion. Then he takes off, the Bible says, and he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Next verse says, But when he has spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent them in, into his fields to feed the swine. And he would have gladly, and, and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. Interesting. I mean, this dude was willing to eat swine slop. When he probably, when, when, he first, when he first left, probably had enough money to buy that farmer out. But he was a bad steward of his money. Right? And so he ends up, now, I'm, stay with me. Because there's parallels here. Because we think, well, I would never do that. But think about it. The Bible is clear of everything that we have. We have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies, it says in Ephesians. But what are we doing with it? What are we doing with what God has already given us? Are we wasting it? Hey. 
because that's kind of an extreme thing, but yet at the same time, uh, what we see is someone that's out there and lost it all. Still, he's a son. You all hear? And so the parallel for us is God has given us everything, but maybe we don't know it. And then we're saying, since I have everything, maybe I can go on my own and do my own thing and so on and so forth, just like he did. And then we are wasting what God has given us. Watch. Next verse says. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's higher servants have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger. So now remember this again. Why would. Why would Jesus be teaching this to his disciples and to those who are supposed to know God? Why am I sharing this this morning? Isn't this for the people out there? No, my friend. Because what he's saying is that, that not, not that he has given up on his father, but he has strayed from his father. Right? Right? And because he's strayed from his father, he still acknowledges, but in my father's house, everything is good. Mm -hmm. There's always two calls. One, to the sinner, and two, for those who know God but need to come back. Well, I've been in church long enough. I'm sure most of you have. You ever been to a service where somebody comes in and, and people know from the church and they hadn't seen that person in years. All of a sudden they come back to the church and everybody, yeah, praise the Lord. And that, that person went out, did drugs, and they came back. That's the prodigal and everybody is happy because they came back not realizing, not realizing that they themselves may be prodigals. No, it's true. And so, therefore, it makes it seem better if this person that is obviously was a mess and, they, and obviously hadn't been to church. But is it possible for prodigals to be in church? And I'm not going to go there to the rest of the story, but the second part of the story was the brother's attitude. The brother's attitude was exposed after he came back. So that means that you had the one that was out there and the one that was inside and they were both in the same boat. But it was harder for the one inside to understand because he was there. But no, that's, that's I can't go there. Even though I just did. Watch. So he says that there is enough in the father's house. He says, but here I am hungry. Next verse. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. It was interesting. Before that verse, it says, and he came to his right mind. Now, when he asked the father, give me my portion, I'm out. The father didn't say, uh-uh. No, 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 you need to, you need to chill out. You need, he says it's yours. What God has given you is yours. If you are astute enough to understand that you have everything and you have no lack, which most people don't, you have everything. And he didn't give it to you because you deserve it. He didn't give it to you because you were that smart or whatever. He gave it to you because of what Jesus did on Calvary. And he doesn't take it back. People go like, man, I, I was so blessed. And it seemed like I made a mistake and God took it back. God does not take stuff back. It's not like us. Hello? He's not like us. But notice this. He did not run after his son. And even knowing that he was in a mess, he did not run after him. Hello? 
Be- why? Because I said I started off by saying those who are out there that don't know God, He chases after them. He chased after me. Thank God. He chased after you. Thank the Lord. But when you are someone who knows him and he has given you your inheritance and then you make the inheritance more important than the one who gave it to you, we're prodigals. And he doesn't chase after us. No, he says, you know who I am. He realized it. When he came to his right mind, the word there in the Greek means... When he came to a single mind. What does that tell us? That he had in his mind other things besides God. Come on. You remember the, the, when Jesus told the disciples, get into the boat, let's, let's go over to the other side. And, um, and, uh, That was a couple of times that he said that. And the Bible says that um, when they got over to the other side, it was where the demoniac was. So his purpose was, we're going to go to the other side because Jesus already knew this guy is going to be delivered. Everybody knew that demoniac. The Bible says everybody knew him. They would try to restrain him. He would break stuff off. He, it was crazy. He would run around butt naked, you know. And, and, and so when they got there, the demon came to Jesus. What are you going to do? He said, what is your name? Now watch. People have built a ministry of deliverance based on that one verse. So they want to know every demon's name. I don't know why. <laughs> no, seriously. You know, I mean, I know I grew up in that stuff, you know. What is your name? I don't care what your name is. What I do care about is you're going to get out. I don't care if your name is Mo, Larry, whatever. you going out. But anyway, so he says, what's your name? Does this have purpose? He said, my name is Legion because what? We are many. So then when Jesus cast it out, it says, and there the man stood, fully clothed, and in his right mind. So he went from being legion, having thousands of different mindsets, to becoming one centered on God. Why did Jesus want the disciples to understand that? Because he wanted to understand that the people that God called now were so, having so many different mindsets and so many different gods that they are just like that demoniac. They're not covered. Hello? Single-minded. What are we to be single-minded of? My needs? His promises? No. His heart. I need to have a single mind to his heart. Lord, what do you want? That's why when we have issues, um, uh, whatever the case may be, is something that God is calling you to do. Um, we go like, hey, man, give me some advice. Uh, you know, because I have people always call me, give me some advice, because I passed the pastor. Man, what do you think of this? I said, well, listen, man, I can give you my advice, but you need to hear from God. Come on. What is God's heart on this? Yeah, then go from there, right? Because, because when we encounter problems, and God knows we do, Yeah, yeah, and you will. Then you have to say, God, what are you saying? Come on. And that's why he he let them know. This guy got delivered because his issue was that he had too many mindsets and too many things that are going on in, in, in his mind, and he forgot that I am the creator. 
Watch it. So then the next verse says, And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. So this is the thing, guys. Can, can, can I, can I, can I, can I? Whether you realize it or not, because our human nature, number one, is to condemn ourselves. Our human nature comes from the fallen Adam. And Adam, after he messed up, he went and covered himself. Come on. Because he thought God is done with me. Come on. And the human nature is this. If you ever feel guilty of anything, chances are, my friend, that you're going to uh, rob yourself of that which God has for you. And that was his issue. His issue was that he messed up royally. And he spent all that God uh, gave him. And he felt so terrible that he thought, I'm going to have to go and I have to humble myself before my father. And even I'll be better off if he makes me a servant in his house. Y'all need to hear me. He was willing to become lower than what God had meant for him or the father had meant for him because of his own guilt. Are y'all here? And there's people who are operating right now, I'm talking about Christians, that are operating below their right, below their kingship, because they've made mistakes and they feel that that's the only level that God would accept from them. Come on. But that means we don't know God's heart what we're looking at and what we're experiencing is what we know from our own heart. That when people hurt us, oh, come on. Or you have issues in a relationship or, or, or somebody done, done stole your money or whatever the case may be. I mean, we go like, uh-uh. No, you're not here. But then he gets there, even though he was willing to just be a servant and serve the Father. My friend, listen to me very carefully. That's why I say this. We are not servants of God. We are sons and daughters of God. And Jesus said it. He said that the, 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 in essence, the servant becomes a son. So then when, they, when he comes to him, he blew him away. Because here's the Father's heart. When he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. So keep in mind that the father only reacted that way when he came back. This message is more for the church. This message is for people who have strayed away from God and they're not, they're not doing drugs. They're not doing anything because we think that oh, a person that has strayed from God is out there committing adultery and doing drugs. My friend, that, that doesn't make sense. No, it is the person that knows God but has moved in a, in a place in their lives where it, it's all about them and no longer God. Hello, and I guarantee you that when we move from God, now you have to deal with things on your own. And that's what he did. When you move away, and, and God knows, man, he, he made us in his image. We got, we were smart people. You can accomplish a lot, but the one thing that you can accomplish is what happens inside of you. You can accomplish a lot outside of you. But there isn't much you can accomplish inside of you. In fact, most people deal out of emotions more than anything. And emotions is what controls them. And emotions is, is and I'm going to tell you, you can accomplish a lot here. 
Because we as human beings, my friend, we're smart. You can have, you can have a great job and, and you can accomplish great things. But one thing that you can't do and you don't have the fortitude to do is take care of your spirit and your emotions. And at the end of the day, that, my friend, is what messes you up. It is the equivalent of eating pig slop. I hate, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's the truth. And, and, but no, but we don't know that because we're like the, the other side, the other brother. Hey man, I'm here, I've been faithful. I've been faithful. Oh, you're not here. No, no, think about it. But he comes and kissed him, watch, because I'm winding down. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy. There it is. You know how many Christians feel they're not worthy? Hello? Many Christians feel more than, than you know. They feel they're not worthy, and if they feel they're not worthy, they, whatever they receive is going to be on that level. But he says, but... I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Next verse. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat. And be merry. There it is again. The father is throwing a party. Two things move God. One, when souls come to him. And two, when Christians repent. No, really. Because they realize, man, I have not put, him, put you first. I have not, you know, I've been, I'm a Christian, but I've been living my own life. Is that possible? And, and you know what? God doesn't want to take anything from you, right? We know that. That's a biblical principle. He ain't trying to get nothing from you. He wants to get something to you. So if we go like, Lord, here's everything. Everything that I am, everything that I have is yours. And God says, I'm about to bless what you put into my hands. Lord, we don't have anything. A few fish and some bread. No, no, no. Give it to me. Put it in my hands. Put it in my hands. Right now you see what you see because it's in your hands. But put it in my hands. And then he looked to the Father and he blessed it. And it's that simple, guys. It's that simple. We call him the Lord, but do we trust him as a father? Or do we see him as the way this guy saw himself? I am not worthy because, I, man, I am weak and I mess up all the time. And God says, no, 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 just come back. Put it in my hands. Come on. And when he did that, he said, now feed those thousands of people, because what you thought you had was not enough. Come on. But in my hands, it's more than enough. And it's that right there. Jesus came to be an example. He is the pattern son. He came to teach us who the father is and what a son is. Come on. But, you know, most people, they go through stuff like that. You go to your bank account. That's the equivalent. What do we have? Go to your bank account. Well, I got $25. Can't do much with that. But that just means that God is not in the picture. That just means that you're not looking to him. That you're not trusting him. That somehow or another, even though you're a Christian and you got saved 200 years ago, you forgot that he is the provider. You forgot that he is who he says he is. So you take that $25 and say, Lord, I put this in your hands because I trust you. You are Jehovah Jireh, my provider. No, no, you don't take that $25 and, and, and play lotto. 
Lord, it's the last $25 I have. I'm going to play the lotto. Let me hit the lotto, Lord. And I promise if I hit the lotto. No, my friend, that does not work. Come on. So he comes back. And the father says, we're going to have a party. We're going to have a party. Bring the best. The best of everything. Because my son was lost. But now he is found. And that's the problem with the church today. The problem with the church today, my friend, is that it has forgotten God's heart. Most of the things you hear about how to run a church and do this and the other or Christians, how Christians can become millionaires and all this kind of stuff, my friend, is borrowed from the world. And most people are pay more attention to that stuff and are more committed to that stuff than they are to the Lord. This is very simple. It is a personal relationship with Christ. Everything comes from him. He owns it all. There's nothing that the world has that God has not allowed them to have. In this new year, my friend, if we don't, if we don't shift our mindset that this is about God, it's about his heart. He who wins souls gives praise to the Lord. Last week we read the scripture where he who plants seeds and he who reaps get rewarded. The, the, the word is he pays them. Why? Why should God bless something that has nothing to do with him? Why should God bless something that you are doing in your own power and in your own strength? That is your blessing. Amen. Amen. That's why it says, whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord, and he will reward you. The problem is that most of what we do, we do it on our own and still want him to reward it. Hello? Oh, Lord, have mercy. Listen, let me see this last verse. This or this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to have a party. What do we party about? I know Latinos, man, we party for anything. <laughs> a snowstorm! Let's party, baby. <laughs> yeah. It's Friday. Time to party. You know, we, we make merry of anything, man. I just got a message. This person was blessed and let's party. You know, really. But what God parties about is when you and I are ministering to him and letting him know the most important thing in my life. Listen, if, and I've said this before. I ain't kidding. If God told me t today, your job is done, RLC, leave it, you, you think I won't? Forty some odd years later, you think I won't? What's the point? If he, if he, if he doesn't want me to have something, I don't want it. Because wherever I go... He's going to bless me. No, I'm not moving to Florida. I don't know what some of you are saying. He's setting us up. He's going to. <laughs> Though I want to. No. But I will only do what the Lord wants me to do. But listen to me very carefully. We have an opportunity, my friend, to do two, two things that, that are part of God's heart. Number one, come back to him. Come back to him. We need to search our hearts. You heard the message. If you feel that you've gone astray because some of this stuff happens and we don't even realize it happens. 
But the, all you have to look at is selfishness. Everything that I do, can I measure it by God's heart or selfishness? And remember what I said, God doesn't want anything from you. But come back. I remember one time, I forget the church, but they were saying that, um, again, a guy that had been gone astray, he was, he was a, a, a powerful speaker, in fact. And then he had went astray, but word got out that he was coming to the church. And they decided, the pastor decided he's going to preach this message. And it goes to show how screwed up we are. How we mis, misinterpreted this whole thing. It's like, oh, that, that particular message was a powerful message. Only applies to that one person that messed up. But you don't know that the hundreds of people there, how many are that same person? Second thing, win souls, plant a seed. Let this be the year that you can say, Lord, I got your heart. I know what you love. I know who you are, and I'm going to plant seeds. And some people are afraid, you know. Oh, no. Suppose that person says no. You know what's one of the, and you've heard me say this before, and some of you can attest to this. If you've ever done multimedia, you know, stuff like that, I mean, uh, uh, not multimedia, um, mul thank you, multi-level marketing and all that kind of stuff, then you, you know this. One of the things they tell you, or if it's in sales, and, and they'll tell you, look, man, if you encounter somebody that does not want to receive what you're, what you're saying, you know what you do? Thank you. Who said that? Oh, that's right. You wouldn't know. <laughs> Seriously. They say, next. No, no, don't trip. Don't take it personal. Don't, 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 no. The only way you're going to make it is if you understand that there is a next. And then... Ten next later, somebody says, I'm in. Amen. Oh, you're not here. So what if somebody laughs at you and you, when you're trying to tell them about the Lord, you know what you say? Yes. Next. Because you're green, but God is going to lead me to somebody that's ripe. Right. Come on. Are you all here? Amen. Don't think that you can't do it. Somebody says, well, I don't know the word well enough. You don't have to. You don't have to, because all you have to do is say, man, this is, this is what God did for me. That's all. And if it doesn't happen, you planted a seed. Even if the person says, man, leave me alone, you planted a seed. Come on now. Would you all stand with me? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now, we're, we're about to get real right now. We're about, about to get real at Real Life Church. You're here. And you, and you realize that you, at times, have felt unworthy of God's blessing. Because of whatever you've gone through. You're here and you feel like, man, I... I've missed God's heart. Everything has been about what I want and what I think or how I feel. But I love the Lord. And I want to put him first in my life. I want, I want to honor his heart. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand real quick. And please don't, just like the sun ran to his father, this is how we do it. Then I want you to come up, guys, because this year I'm determined that we're going to make this altar a place of miracles. 
This is the place of miracles right here. Hallelujah. Come on, come on, come on. Come on up. Make room. Make room. Because what we're doing when we come up here, what we're saying is, Lord, help me this year to draw closer to you. Let this be the year when I get in touch with your heart. And last, last Sunday I talked about the disciple that Jesus loved. Remember that? This, this is empty right here in the middle. I know you all think I spit. I actually do, but, but come on, fill this, fill this gap right here. And even if I spit, man, you may be healed today. <laughs> So the disciple that Jesus loved, because it's the way love works, is because that disciple loved him more than the others. And Jesus always responds to you, how you minister to him. Why? Some people don't understand that. Doesn't he love everybody? Why would he only respond to this? And he did. He doesn't have to prove his love. For God so loved the world. He died on that cross for us. But now, after that, is a matter of relationship. He wants to know, do we have a relationship? And if we do, why don't you talk to me? If we do, how come you don't spend time with me? How come? Are you here? But that disciple, John, when Jesus would come to teach and he would sit down, John, he didn't care what people thought. He didn't care because people can be mean. People could have said, oh, I think he's gay. You know, no, really, you know, people are crazy. No, he would go and, and, and snuggle up to Jesus and put his head in, on his bosom. And while Jesus is teaching, this guy is laying on his chest. And it blows people away when it says in the disciple that Jesus loved. Well, how is that possible? Because he loved him. And he would hear his heart. The heartbeat of Jesus. My friend, the church has come so far from the Lord I'm not impressed with big churches some people are I hate when people oh man look at that church who cares who cares who cares the biggest church in the New Testament the church in Corinth was the first, first mega church and Paul, all he did was rebuke it because they were so far from God. The most gifted church of his time, Paul said it. He said, but you're a bunch of babies. You don't even, you, you're not mature. You don't even know God, right? You want meat, but you can't have meat. All you need is milk because you're still babies. Who cares about the size of it? Oh, my goal is to have a mega church. Well, shame on you. Your goal should be to know the heart of God. Come on. I know pastors are listening to me. So what? Anyway, no, seriously. Why? Personal relationship. So when you come up here, you're not just coming. This is not a ritual. Hey, come on up. Hey, praise the Lord. Let's have a prayer, everybody. See ya. No, my friend. When you come up here, you're making a statement. Your statement is, Lord, I am more interested in your heart than what I want. And watch what God will do this year because of that. It's not, it's not because you get a prophetic word or it's not because, no, 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 no. It's what you do that counts. This is a prophetic word. I mean, the prophecy comes from the pulpits all over the world and so on. But how do you respond to it? It's what makes the difference. Raise your hands all over this place. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for who you are. 
And many of us have gone astray, not on purpose. Just things that have happened and times, Lord, when we feel like if we don't do it, nothing will happen. But Lord, we know that your heart toward us is clear. And your heart toward our response and to this to this world, we know it. For God so loved the world. And so, Lord, we ask you today, continue to reveal your heart to us. Continue, Father, to make our heart of stone into a heart of flesh. That we may reassess our lives and reassess how far we've gone from you and how we can come back and you don't hold anything against us. When we come back, Lord, you throw a party. My daughter, my son were lost, but now they are found. And so, Lord, we thank you. We've never lost our inheritance. We've, we have just strayed from it. Thank you for your people. Thank you, Lord, for people that have a heart toward you. It's why they come up. Is they acknowledge, yes, I want to get closer to the Lord. Yes, I want to, to hear his heartbeat. I thank you for, for these people. Right now, in the name of Jesus, in this atmosphere, I declare healing for those that are sick. In the name of Jesus. That is your heart as well, Father. On the cross, you paid the price for our healing. By your stripes, we are healed. And Father, right now, we pray for physical healing. Whoever needs a physical healing, raise your hand. I, I want to know who you are. Who, who are you? Who are you? Yes, yes, yes. Father, you see the hands. You know the hearts. They've been actually crying out to you. I know. Lord, heal us. And right now, in the name of Jesus... Father, in this atmosphere of love in your heart, I pray that you right now would touch every person that needs a physical healing, Father. We said and declared that this year was going to be the year of miracles and turnaround. And Father, right now, we're believing you for a miracle in the mighty name of Jesus. There's some here who have been struggling mentally. You, you've been, you've been, it's been hard for you. You can't turn it off. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And your mind keeps racing and so on. You're losing sleep over that stuff. Listen to me very carefully. Healing is yours today. Amen. Because we realize that, yes, there's medicine and doctors and so on and so forth but a lot of that stuff my friend all that does is suppress what you're going through it does not take care of it and we serve a God that's a healer Jehovah Rapha our healer listen to me very carefully it was no coincidence when they took that crown of thorns and jammed it on his head and all that blood started flowing from the head that was the redemption of man's mind. The renewing of the mind has everything to do with, with a peace of mind. Come on. You can say, I, you know, my mind has been renewed, but if you're still going crazy, it has not. Because the renewing of the mind has to do with a mind of peace. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Jesus took care of everything. But he needs our, come on, our response of faith. He needs for us to believe it. And whenever you find it hard to believe, ask the Holy Spirit, who is your helper, to help you. Raise your hands. Father, those who are struggling psychologically, mentally. Father, in the name of Jesus, 
because of your love for us, we ask, give us peace. Help us, Lord, to focus on you, focus on your peace. Father, we do not want to repeat last year. This year, we want to be free. This is the year we come back to you. This is the year that we will feel and sense like the very first time we came to you. We thank you. Help us to win souls. Help us to stay firm and to stay focused. Help us, Lord, to serve you and to minister to you. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Do you believe it, church? Yeah. Amen. Give the Lord a good clap offering. Amen. And we are going to move forward in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Love you so dearly. Thank God that they changed the Steelers game to tomorrow.